Cricket Podcast with me, Lily and Josh. Hello, everybody. So I am back from holiday. <laughs> yes, back was, from the USA. I was on a two-week holiday. It was nice to just get away and have a bit of a break. Especially not being able to go away for like well, two, three years. Yeah, we're all about holidays. So it was a, it was tough, but we we're able to get away again um, as soon as those borders opened. And yeah, it was good to just... Gone a bit of a yeah, a bit of a break from schoolwork and and all that. So yeah, that was that was that. So that's why we didn't talk any cricket because it was um yeah, I wasn't wasn't here. But right. I'm back now and just in time for the fair break tournament. Mm-hmm. But before we talk about the fair break tournament, uh, we do have another interview for you this week. So we talked to South Australian Scorpions and Adelaide Strikers WVBL coach Luke Williams and it was really good to talk to Luke wasn't it? It was amazing it was really cool to just talk to him about how the Scorps and Strikers girls are going and just what cricket in, in SA for the women looks like for the future it was really good. Yeah it, he did give us a good insight on the behind the scenes of being a coach and and I, I thought it was really interesting to hear about how much control the captain has compared to how much control the coach has. Um, so, yeah, we talked to Luke all about coaching women's teams. So we hope you enjoy our interview with Luke Williams. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Can you talk to us a little bit about where you are at the moment and what you've just ended up doing with your cricket coaching just past? Yeah, thanks, Lily and Josh, for the opportunity to, to come on. Um, yeah, really looking forward to, to having a chat um, today. But um, last few years have been really exciting in, in um, my cricketing journey. Um, so at the moment, yeah, my role, obviously, is, is um, head coach of the SA Scorpions and um, the Adelaide Strikers WBBL teams, um, which I've loved. So um, just completed our, our third, or my third season as, as head coach and, um, had a reasonably successful year. We were able to to make the finals, uh, make the final in in both competitions. Um, unfortunately, fell short on on um, each of those occasions. Um, but that's certainly going to motivate us um, for for next season and and beyond. So um, obviously the season's just finished and um, just in the process of of conducting our our end of season reviews and and starting to look at um, our contracted lists for for next season. So um, still a bit of a busy time, but um, yeah, the players um, from the from the Scorpions have um, just started their um, leave period, which um, they're very excited about, and um, staff will will follow in the hopefully in the next week or two. Yeah, you said um, that you we made both finals, which is fantastic, but it's hard like to lose both of them and then just um, what 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 what's the feeling like after that? You just you t- try and take all the positives out of it and just see what you guys can do for next year. Yeah, for sure. That um, yeah, certainly. It's um, whilst there's a, a sense of pride in in making the final and, and having a good tournament, um, there's still a a real hurt from from the day itself and, and not quite being able to get over the line. Um, I suppose each of the teams have, have um, whilst there's there's some players that, that play in both, they are they are different groups and and probably on different journeys at at different times too. So for the for the strikers, um, I'll start with. With that, it was our second grand final in a in a three year period, um, and yeah, we felt we were we were really building nicely for the final. We probably played two of our best games of cricket in the in our in the eliminator and the and the challenger at Adelaide Oval. So we knew that the Perth Scorchers were were a fantastic team and had some formidable players. Um, but um, yeah, we certainly thought our our best cricket um, would be good enough um, on the day, and and I thought we played pretty well for for large parts of the match, um, to be honest, but um, we probably had um, a slightly disappointing batting power play and, and that probably was the difference in the in that particular match. Um, so again, it's a, the WBBL is such a competitive tournament with, with so many really good players um, and teams um, in the tournament, um, probably evidenced by the fact that the Sydney Sixers with, with um, such a strong list, I, I think ended up coming seventh or eighth or whatever it was this year. And and obviously, we've got so much respect for, for, for them as a, a team and, and players, but it shows the depth of the, the competition now. So 
delighted to, to make that final, but still um, from a striker's point of view, we think we've got um, a list that can, can win a title and we're, we're desperate to do that. Um, from a Scorpions point of view, probably coming off the back of some tough years, um, to, to be honest. And um, end of last season, we um, managed to win some games and we started to build some confidence and belief in the group and, and we just missed out in the final last year. And, and um, this year, um, probably um, continued, continued that. There's some challenges at the moment with, with the national players being away, which is giving some great opportunities though, to, to some, some young talent in, in South Australia and, and they stood up um, this season. So um, again, very pleased to make the final. I thought Tasmania were an excellent side and, and they showed that in the final. I thought we weren't overawed and we probably were slightly below par with our, our 240, but um, still pleased with that performance. But um, Tasmania and Elise Villani and, and Emma Mannix G's were, were just too good on the day and uh, they ended up winning comfortably. Uh, you, that that partnership, you can't do much against that. That was just incredible. They batted the house down. And like you said, um, with the national players away, it gives so much great opportunity for our talent and people coming through. Emma Debro, she's had a fantastic year. Um, and our superstar all-rounder now, Ellie Falconer. So yep. it was great to see her and others as well just step up. And Kate, um, Kate Peterson, she's got a future ahead as well. Yeah, as I said, with, with those opportunities and, and that was um, as much as making the final was, was pleasing. It was just that, that growth and development in those players and, and seeing the belief that they've got now at the, the level that I think is going to hold um, them in, in really good stead in, in their careers and, and the Scorpions moving forward. So, yeah, Emma Debro had, had had some opportunities over the last sort of two or three years, but for her to, um, I think, averaged over 35 for the season and, and formed a really formidable opening partnership with, with Bridget Patterson. Um, so, so pleased for, for Emma. Um, Ellie, as well, has, has had some interruptions with um, injury over the last year, 18 months. And, and again, her, her belief in, um, in herself and, and just getting the opportunity, I suppose, to, to um, be the strike bowler in the attack with, with a few people away. Um, again, she thrived on, on that responsibility as well. And, and Kate Peterson in her first season certainly showed that she's um, capable at the, the level and has a, a really bright future as well. Yeah, no, it, it, I, I really love the future that we're looking at here. Who is um who is the future star in the like um emerging scorps that are who who we, who we should look out for? Yeah, I think um I think that's a another um I guess really exciting thing that there's some some players in in Premier cricket like a Kelly Armstrong who has been contract before that continues to to perform strongly and 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 push her case um, forward there. Um, the under 19 national championships is actually on as we as we speak at the moment, and and um, South Australia has, has um, had a great tournament so far, and is is um, going to play in the, the final tomorrow in in that. I think today's oh. games will de- today's games will determine the the opposition for that. But um, again, for for South Australia to to make an under 19 um, national championships final, and and there's a real um, depth of talent and, and excitement with with what's building. So. Um, yeah, really, really pleased with the work Darius White has, has done in the Pathways programs and, and that sort of culminated in, in a really strong national championships performance. And I think that's going to augur well for, for South Australian cricket moving forward. You mentioned earlier about quite a few of the Australian uh, Scorpions being away. Did that alter any of your initial plans or did you not really have any specific plans because you knew that they weren't going to be there? Or, or how did that change? Did you have to change any plans there? Yeah, it's probably been um, as it has been for everyone in the in the world the last year or two. There's there's been lots of changes. So, in terms of the scheduling of the WNCL um, was pushed back. I can't remember how many times, maybe four or five times across the year. So, for for most of the season, we probably um, thought that um, we'd have some availability um, from those players, um, but we're probably aware at, at different times that it's unlikely given the Australian calendar and and where some of our players sit now in in that Australian selection um, that we're not going to have them for the for the full season so obviously um, Megan's been a, a large part of that program for a long time and a staple of, of the Australian team so that was a given but um, yeah Darcy and, and Talia have really um, established themselves I believe in in that in that team so um, we're certainly 
quite confident with that. And we were very hopeful that Amanda Jade Wellington was going to be selected and we were delighted when really some consistent performance those over a, a long period of time was rewarded with her re-entry into that program. So that was that was probably the one we were waiting on and, um, and there. Um, but certainly in our program, um, whilst we're aware of the possibility, it's obviously still a, a big hole when, when those players um, leave at the, at the moment. Megan and, and Talia are obviously captain and vice captain of the Scorpions as well. So there's a, certainly from that point of view, that's, that's something that we're continuing to, to plan for and, and work on our, I guess, our next generation of, of leaders, especially as the, the national schedule gets busier and busier. Um, we're sort of hoping that in a way that we don't see many of, of those players, we want them to be playing for Australia. It's exciting for them. That's the pinnacle of, of, of cricket. It's almost why um, we exist in a way. Of, of course, we want to win WNCL titles and um, want to be really consistent in our in those domestic com um, competitions. But at the end of the day, we, we really want to produce players that are playing for Australia and able to live out live out their dreams. So, um, yeah, certainly hopeful of, of that. But um, Gemma Barsby did a, a great job this year. She was appointed acting captain for, for this tournament and um, obviously a steep learning curve for, for Gemma. Um, has, experienced at WBB, WBBO and WNCL level, but um, first time sort of captaining it at the level. And but certainly from a, a leadership point of view um, on and off the field, they're the sort of things that we need to continue to work on as we as we probably expect to see um, less and less of, of Megan and Talia and, and others. Yeah, they, they, uh, we would love to see an entire Australian team with SA players. That would be fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, you talked about experiences. Tegan has retired. So that, leaves another void to be filled in the experience department there. Yeah, huge, a huge loss um, on and off the field, um, Tegan. Um, she's been such a um, brilliant servant of, of South Australian cricket and the, the SA Scorpions Adelaide Strikers. At, at this stage, her retirement is, is um, I guess, been confirmed for the SA Scorpions. It's still, we're still hopeful we may be able to twist her arm for, for one more year in the WBBL, um, but we'll, we'll work through that over the next um, little bit. But yeah, Tegan's, I think, is a, she's an outstanding wicket keeper um, and has backed up um, a really strong bowling attack um, with that. But um, I think her statistics probably will never really tell the, the full picture of the contribution that she's made to South Australian cricket. She's really inspired um, a lot of the players that are within the Scorpions now, her standards and the way she goes about her. Um, cricket is of a, an elite level and um, just a great role model. So um, we're going to miss her um, terribly. She won't be lost, I'm sure, to, to South Australian cricket. She's she's so passionate about the game and and um, the programs and, and the people that are within it that I'm sure she'll continue to, to contribute. But as you said, her, her experience is going to be a huge loss for us. Yeah, she, she's had a fantastic career and she's absolute SA icon in cricket and we'll see her bowling her thunderbolts in indoor cricket for sure i guess going right back to the very start could you talk to us about how you first got involved in cricket just in general yeah um probably same as a lot of people it was through my my parents yeah my my dad played um a lot of district cricket or grade cricket premier cricket in in south australia so I certainly grew up watching watching dad play um and then yeah just in the backyard um but yeah grew in a family that that love cricket with, with mum and dad um, from there. And yeah, it was never really um, any pressure to play. It was just what was done, they say. I, um, yeah, very quickly, um, yeah, started in, in some junior cricket at the Adelaide Cricket Club. And um, yeah, I think that was at eight or nine years of age, um, sort of my formal cricket. Um, before that was just in the backyard or the nets with, with dad and I've got a younger brother. So um, lots of time spent doing that and, and then, um, but straight away, really, my love for the game was was evident and, and obvious. And um, yeah, so love playing and 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 really um, progressed through um, playing cricket into my early thirties. And and as soon as that stopped, um, or as soon as I made the decision for that to stop, got straight into into coaching. So yeah, so far it really has been a, a lifetime of of cricket. And um, yeah, love the game. How did your um? coaching start and were you interested in the women's game or did you start in the men's game how did that come about yeah so I, I stopped playing at probably 31 and I think um initially um sort of an assistant coaching role at a at a district club um and very quickly started doing some work I reckon within a, a year or two um in the 
mail pathways program sort of um, and end up what's that seven seventeens and and those sort of teams for instance um, yeah always had an interest in the just in cricket in general so um, watching all cricket whether it was male cricket female cricket and those sort of things but um, I guess my my first foray into into the female game was was through Andrew McCauley um, had a long conversation um, with her probably must be six or seven years ago, right? Um, I think it was at the start of the second season of the WBBL around whether I had any interest in, in being involved and, and helping out, and um, which I did. I was really excited and flattered to be um, asked to and, and um, just loved um, that experience straight away. Um, yeah, I thought I loved working with the girls. Um, I loved the atmosphere of the the team that I was involved in and I love the competition the WBBL straight away was um, just really exciting and, and vibrant and, and um, competitive and and that so um, it just went from there um, really um, but yeah again um, yeah very grateful to, to Andrew McCauley to to think of me at the time and, and to, to give me my first opportunity. Yeah you're doing a great job mate it was huge huge shoes to fill I would say because Andrew is an SA icon as well. And she, what she's done with the programs and what you're continuing to do is just fantastic. Yeah, Andrea's, as you said, um, probably can't be replaced to be honest. And yeah, her legacy and, and what she continues to do is still um, involved with the SACA board and, and SACA High Performance Committee and um, her counsel and, and, and guidance is, is still um, very valuable and appreciated by, by South Australian cricket. So we know what a game day looks like for players, but what does a game day look like from a coaching perspective? What is like your, your schedule on a game day? <laughs> um, obviously the, the 50 over games are a lot longer days than the, the T20 games. It's one of the benefits of, of T20 cricket. Um, but I think um, a, lot of, a lot of thinking and a lot of planning beforehand, I guess, and, and going through different scenarios, especially in... in um, T20 cricket, being aware of um, situations that could happen, whether we start well or whether we start poorly or different matchups that we may be looking to, to make and, and just make sure that, that um, I guess, messaging with, with captains and vice captains or, or senior players are, are really clear and, and I guess each player is, is clear of the, the roles that they're going to do. So, yeah, a lot of thinking in the morning of, of what I'm going to say or if I'm going to speak or um, if I'm not going to speak, who's best equipped to speak. Sometimes it's best that it's a different voice and, and thinking about different days, it, it might be better off from the players or talking to players around what sort of message we, we want to get across and who's the best person to, to deliver that. So, um, yeah, probably the day often starts with, with some breakfast and coffee and, and an hour or two with a pad in front and, and thinking about that and, and making sure that, um, we're really clear on, on those things. Um, from there, um, getting to the ground, it's a combination of um, helping with some batters warm up and, and throwing a lot of balls and, and doing that. But certainly in my role, it's also trying to, to get to all 12 or 13 of the players and, and just check in and say good day and, and try and, um, I think on game day, the work has been done and will be done, so, or has already been done, sorry. So it's certainly my philosophy is around trying to create an environment that's um, reasonably relaxed and, and allows the players to, to, to be the best versions of themselves on, on the day because naturally uh, we all care and we all want results. So there's, there's often nerves around and those sort of things are, are pretty strong on the fact that um, we want to make sure that our, our coaches and our support staff aren't, aren't adding to any of that um, stress or anxiety. So um, yeah, it's, it's really there around making sure the players are, are clear and, and making sure that their, their belief and, and their understanding and, and the confidence that, that we're giving them is at a, a really high level so that um, they can go out and, and hopefully enjoy themselves and, and play their best games. I hear a lot about players and even coaches like studying the other teams. Do you do mm. that? And if so, what kind of things do you look at when you're coming up against another team? Yeah, it's always a, it's always a balance, I think, in terms of... Um, the simple answer is yes, we yes we do. But it's always a balancing act of, of how much information that we want to give our players or how much our players need. And it's probably understanding our players. There's some players that love information are able to digest quite a lot of information and and not get cluttered by that. Um, 
because it's also not just about obviously what the opposition does. It's, it's us wanting to play to our strengths and, and dictating the play too. Um, certainly the, the T20 game in particular, the, um, and, and still in the 50 over game, but, but more so in the T20 game, matchups are, are huge at the moment. So we do a lot of work on um, with Alice around um, statistical data. So we'll know, for instance, um, the first five balls that are, a batter will face against pace and spin their strike rates or chance of getting out and, and which one might be a better match up with that. Um, different types of bowling. If we've got more in-swing bowls compared to outswing, if they've got a preference there, we look at um, their scoring zones and, and those sort of things. Um, so again, um, yeah, we look at a lot of that, that thing for, for, for our batters that might be looking at what types of um, change of pace options they've got or when they when they tend to go to that or um if on a on a free hit they always go to a slow ball or a bouncer we can start to pick up those trends and sometimes we might be wrong if we <laughs> suggest that the last six have done that and then all of a sudden <laughs> the seventh one will be something different but um they're little things yeah that we try and pick up and i think in the t20 game they do they do play a reasonably significant role to to give yourself the best chance um but as we talked about um, earlier, I think there's a real balancing act between knowing what the opposition is going to do, but also um, our players being really comfortable in, in going to their strengths and knowing their strengths as, as well. Do you collaborate with Dizzy in the men's program at all with uh, different tactics sometimes as well? Yeah, we, that's, um, yeah, very lucky to have, have Dizzy at, at the soccer and, and the strikers. So certainly through in the office or different times as, He's a great resource to be able to have a chat to and has obviously coached a number of different teams. So, so certainly there's, um, yeah, collaboration, discussion with, with what they're doing or how they're presenting information and um, the types of, um, for instance, statistical data that they're getting and, and seeing if it's relevant. Obviously, different times, there's, there's aspects of the male game that, that closely resembles the female game. There's, obviously, there's also differences in terms of, yeah, for instance, we've um, only got four fielders out compared to five, so the types of gaps or where the gaps are at, at different times, um, as I said, can be different. But um, yeah, certainly, um, I think over over the over the years um, we have collaborated and, and certainly want the squads um, and the playing groups even to collaborate more than than what we have. I think it's um, again different ideas from from different people. Are, are fantastic so it's a, a resource that we we do and, and and should continue to use yeah no, that, that's really good yeah i know that when the men and the female games were together like the double headers i did see that there was a bit of collaboration between amanda wellington and mm. rashid khan and talking about bowling does any of that still happen now because i know that the seasons are quite separate and not together anymore so mm. do, the, do the male and female players come together and, and collaborate at all? Yeah, certainly good question, Lily. I think it's, it's certainly um, less than what it used to, as you said, because of the um, the nature of the schedules now. And I know from speaking to, to various people who are involved in the 100 in the in the UK, they saw that as one of the, the real strengths, again, of the of that was the collaboration between the two teams and the and the two coaching squads and, and the opportunities for that were were um, quite straightforward. Um, whereas at the moment, certainly um, a little bit more challenging. I think a lot of the, the conversations and the collaboration, for instance, with with strikers or SA Scorpions players are probably more likely to be with South Australia, either Redbacks players or Redbacks players that are in the strikers program. Because obviously the um, interstate and overseas players that, are, that join the strikers BBL team will often arrive well after the WBBL program has concluded or even our T20 focus has, has almost concluded for the season. But um, yeah, certainly at, at different times, players have, have um, reached out to, you know, Travis or Alex Carey and, and the, um, the guys have been superb really with, with that. They're, they're very open with their, their time and, and, and thoughts and, um, yeah, certainly um, are very receptive to that. Um, the Scorpions this year, Callum Ferguson did some, some work with, with some batters across the, the pre-season and, um, and then in-season, in our assistant coach, Jude Coleman, um, was... Um, the, the head coach of an Australia A series against England A, eh? so, so Jude was on the road for, for three weeks and, and uh, we were fortunate, uh, fortunate enough that Chad Sayers um, stepped into to Jude's sort of bowling role over those three weeks. Um, so again, it's been great to be, have that collaboration and, and to use their experiences um, as well. 
Yeah, yeah. no, that's uh, some have. very great names to learn from there. Callum Ferguson and Chad Sayers, legends. Um, how is it having Jude come over? I've been, I've been watching her in indoor for a few years now, but just her brain, that would must be great to have on board. Yeah, she's had a, a tremendous influence on on the program and the teams. Um, so um, she's been here my entire time as, as head coach the, the three seasons and, and been a great, um, as I said, um, great support for, for me. Um, yeah, Jude's had a, an unbelievable career, um, not only in um, indoor cricket, where I think she's the known as the goat. Um, she is in, the goat, yeah. In, <laughs> yeah, in uh, female indoor cricket, but her yeah. um, outdoor cricket career had a, a really distinguished career for, for Queensland and and just her knowledge of the game and, and the way she um, thinks is is elite. Um, comes from a teaching background, as, as a lot of coaches um, do, so um, is able to incorporate a lot of... Um, those experiences and learnings and, and how to um, pass information on um, through that. And um, yeah, she's been fantastic to, to work with um, over the last three years. Yeah, no, it's great to, she looks a lot better in SA colours than Queensland, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, again, it's, um, yeah, we're really fortunate to have, to have Jude. I think um, again, it's also about um, for us as it is with, with players trying to um, assist staff and achieve their goals and and I think um, Jude um, at some stage and maybe in the not too distant future will be a, an unbelievable head coach of a, of a program so um, grateful for however long we can hang on to Jude but um, certainly um, really looking forward to um, watching her career as well over the years to come because she has a, a, a really exciting career ahead of her in, in the coaching world. So last year well the season before the the one that just happened we had Susie Bates as the captain for the strikers and then it turned to Tali McGrath so what was that like what was how did Talia cope with it how did you work with Talia to prepare her for that captain role yeah it's a, obviously a little bit um different and it, it probably happened in the, the last few weeks before the tournament in terms of um um mm-hmm. Susie withdrawing from the from the WBBL um, for, for this season due to some, some border complications and issues um, there. Um, and then um, last, the season before that, uh, Megan Shoot had been acting captain um, when Susie was injured um, in that tournament. Um, but there was, um, obviously Megan had uh, a pretty exciting time ahead of her with the impending birth of of um, her first child. So we knew that, that her the start of the WBBL season was going to be a challenge for her in terms of her availability and, and also just her, we wanted her focus to, to really be where it needed to be on, on her family and, and those sort of things. So I guess we were quite collaborative with, with Megan around what was going to be best for the team and, and those sort of things. And I think we both reached a decision that, that the same captain through the tournament was going to be the, the, the right way to go and um, the standout candidate for that was was Talia and um, again Talia's growth in in her own cricket over the last year or two has been immense but her her leadership and and what she what she does off the field to to support her teammates and um, her communication skills and um, her ability to get the best out of, of other people she's always been enormously respected for for what she does and the way she carries herself and, and leading by example but her um, I guess her, as I said, her communication, her voice and, and the, the little things she can do, whether it's one-on-one off the field and, and the conversations that, that she had um, both with, with younger players, but also, you know, some of your more experienced players, Megan and, and Dane or um, players like that, she was able to um, lead across the team. So she did a superb job um, this season and um, I think she really grew into, grew into the role and I think um, leadership is something that she's really well suited to and um, I think moving forward I, I certainly wouldn't put it past Talia being able to captain at the highest level um, given her skills both on the field and, and her leadership skills if, if the opportunity arose in, in the years to come so um, yeah delighted with Talia's progress and, and um, yeah thought she had a great season in, in her first season in that role. Yeah she really has started to show what she's really capable of like as an all-rounder I think there's and that's shown in the World Cup and in in the Women's Ashes series as well so I think it's brilliant to see her start to to show what she can do. 
But how much control does the captain have on game day? What can Talia do? What decisions can she make? And and what sort of things do you then be like, well, maybe not? <laughs> what, does the, what does the coach allow? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, well, the, the truth, the answer is um, Talia has absolute control, to be honest, has total control on, on game day. And that's the way it needs to be. I, I believe in, in the cricket um, field. We've obviously talked... In, in the days leading up to, to games, we've obviously talked for, for long periods of time and, and are probably pretty consistent with, with what we're thinking and um, have some plans going into the game. And, and um, certainly if there's things that we have different points of view, they've generally been worked through well, well in advance of the game to, to find something that, that, we're, that we're all really happy with to, to go in with a, a plan and being communicated to the players. Um, but on, on, on game day, irrespective of what plans that we've had in place. Um, it's really important that, that Talia knows and, and feels that she's got the complete support of, of the coaching staff to, to make any decision that she sees fit on the day. And if she, and we really trust her and encourage her to, to back her, her hunches, if she sees something that, that might be um, not what we've talked about, but she really believes it worked or if she, there's someone on field that she trusts and wants to talk to and runs it past and the two of them, think that's a really good idea just yeah we would encourage Talia just to go for it um and have no regrets with with those sort of things and and really anything that is afterwards um that is against I guess plans that we've gone going to the game provided there's there's reasons for it and, and they're articulated and it's been thought thought, thought through um there's never going to be any any qualms from from the coaching staff it would only be if um if it was done on a bit of a whip or or unsure <laughs> that we'd probably say we probably would have preferred a little bit more, a little bit more thought on on that. But um, yeah, on on game day, it's it's very much um, the captain's ship, and and we support. We're there to support the the captain and and the playing group. We do have the opportunity, I guess, which is um, fortunate. We were able to get out there at the ten over mark in um, the the WBBL. So that's been something over the last couple of years that we're we're continuing to to work through. What's the best way to to go about that? And forty five seconds or whatever it is can go pretty quickly. So it's it's you know whether yeah whether it's just them asking a question of us or if there's different ways we can we can do things. Um, what's going to give us our, our biggest bang for our buck in in that time? Um, but again, it's it's also you don't want to then spend 45 seconds where there's five or six points that are, are, are given across and all of a sudden Talia or the players are, are pretty confused <laughs> leading into the last ten overs of the the innings there. So we we generally try and keep it pretty simple and. And certainly it's in, in both formats, the um, WBBL, WNCL, it's, it's very much um, the captainship on, on game day. Yeah, no, definitely what you said touched on there. You don't want to bombard them with anything. Like you just want to, if you notice 10 things, you just go, all right, what's the two most important things? So no, that's, that's a good insight. Yeah. yeah, and there'll be certain days where it might be our, our time, Talia's got everything in hand and doesn't need anything from us. It actually might be better off that, a technical thing with a particular bowler or a fielder or or something like that we might be better off actually spending our time with the positioning on the field we actually might be better off our boundary riders being three or four meters off because the outfield's a bit slower we think they're going to run too so our time might be better spent with with Bridget or Katie Mack or our, our boundary riders talking about that than necessarily just talking to the captain or about bowling changes and, and leave that to to them so different days are differently different days are different with with how we go about that and the tactics and we're probably still trying to work out what's the best way to to utilize that time so yeah that's really interesting because I always sit there I don't know about anybody else but when I'm watching I'm always sitting there going I just I wonder what they're talking about like I just mm. want to jump out there and that <laughs> in between those 20 overs and just wonder what they're talking about but has there ever been a point where everything's just gone so well what do you do if everything's just going so well in between those times? Yeah, it's interesting because it's happened, quite, it's happened quite a bit. And in the end, we've in the end, I guess my philosophy has been that we still go out there at that time just so it's, I guess, that we feel like we're consistently doing the same thing rather than that we're not going out when things are going well. And all of a sudden, when the opposition are on top, the coach wanders out. And even from a perception point of view, I guess, trying to, to, um, yeah, make sure that's not the case. But yeah, there's certainly there's um, there's days where you they're the good days when you walk out at ten overs and there's fifteen runs needed. I think it happened in one of the finals, and um, that's pretty much yeah. How good is this? And keep going. And but yeah, um, but yeah, there's certainly days where 
there's not that much cricket spoken. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. no, go and play, play mind games. It's good, like 15 months ago. Why is Luke going out? Yeah. Like, he doesn't need to go out. And you're just like, I'll be yeah. here if you need. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, certainly, um, yeah, no, nah, I'm not necessarily trying to get myself on TV or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty, Definitely know, not. I'm, I'm pretty happy to stay away from, from that stuff. So, um, yeah, but, but I, it's more the consistency that we we try and do the same every time rather than, I feel like it's either you don't go out there at all and you stick to that or you, you go out there all the time. I, I, that's probably, again, consistency and, and making sure the players are, are calm and, and those sort of things. Are, really- if that's part of your coaching philosophy, then I think that probably leads into to having to be consistent with, with what we do there. So, um, yeah, as I said, I think it's as, much, it's as much us being out there for anything that the players need as well as, as us um, giving information from the sideline. Sometimes we're better off holding that until after the game. Sometimes it's just, yeah, checking in with, with Tali or, or some players. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, yeah con- consistency is really good, really good. Yeah, so I was just wondering, because the game against the Renegades, after we played that game against the Heat, that was still probably one of the best games of cricket I've ever seen in my entire life. So the Renegades chose to play at Adelaide Oval because they couldn't play in Melbourne. Um, and they and they were such a strong team for that whole season that's just happened. So what were your initial plans going into that game? And then how did they change? Because the Renegades just didn't play like they had been playing all season. Yeah, it was um, it was interesting because it was obviously a very tight turnaround between the, the Heat game. I think it was a night before, wasn't it? I think it was mm. like in second nights. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure they were. Um, so I think in a way that played into our hands because we, we had an, an enormous confidence and, and belief and it, it, uh, for us, we'd, we'd played um, three games at Adelaide Oval in a really tight period of time um, on the Saturday, Sunday, and then was it Wednesday, Thursday or Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it was, those games. So um, I think we, we went in with quite a lot of confidence. Um, again, we probably did it a little bit differently because of the turnaround. The, the heat game obviously finished at, at night. So um, our preview of the Renegades, we'd already played them twice through the season um, for, for one win and one loss. Um, so we, we knew who we were coming up against, but I think we, that day we um, end up, if the game was a 6.40 game, I think we met something like 4.30 and, and had a quick run through of the Renegades and, and just our, our plans um, that day. Um, but um, yeah, we went in with a lot of confidence. Um, I think there are a couple of, of really key wickets in, in that, in that game. Obviously, Harlan Preet core had an amazing tournament and, um, and Jimmy Rodriguez as, as well, but they had a lot of, of, of really good players, including some South, South Australians in, in Webb and Dooley, but you know, Jess Duffin and, and, and others. So there was a, a lot to prepare for a wicket first ball of the game again from, from Megan shoot. I think, um, we bowled first, which is what we'd done the night before. Um, so I think there were, uh, it was just a lot of confidence going into that and uh, a lot of belief in the, in the group. And um, obviously we, we started well with the wicket first ball and, and then as, as I guess Rodriguez and, um, and, and Core were, were dismissed, I think that just added to, to our belief and um, probably as our, our belief grew, there was probably some, um, made it harder for the, for the Renegades and, and from there, um, yeah, we were able to, I think play one of our, our best games of cricket but, um, for for a number of years in a in a final. So that was that was really exciting and and even um, those two days the, the chases they should be they should be straightforward but sometimes they're they're not. So uh, that's what I was so pleased about is, is we were still really brave and took the game on and and were able to to still put pressure back on the bowlers and and not look to just get those sort of scores as five six down in the nineteenth and twentieth over. We 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 tried to. To, to play the way that we'd, we'd played or the way that we're capable of. And, and, and on those two days, we were able to execute. But, um, yeah, they were, they were good days, good nights. Uh, the, those two games, they were, like you said, they are probably our best games that we played all year. But it's good to get two wins in a final series. I know we didn't get the big one, but those two games, they were absolutely fantastic and the girls did amazing. Um, with back-to-back games, is it better to, like, come into the second game, like, having played a game... I know you're not as fresh, but probably the mindset's probably better. Mm. I think, um, yeah, mindset's generally the, the huge thing. The girls are 
have worked hard at the fitness and, and those sort of things. And we put a, a lot of effort into rest and recovery and, and those sort of things um, across across the tournament. So, so really, um, it is a mindset point of view because if you're playing back-to-back -back games, you're either coming off the back of a win and then the ability to still front up and 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 back that up, um, or you're coming off the back of a loss and then all of a sudden, it's a different dynamic there. Um, I guess across the, the history of the, the WBBL, um, especially um, in previous seasons where you, you sometimes played the same opposition twice on a, on a weekend, the amount of times that those games were shared one and one across the weekend, um, which isn't probably surprising given the, the um, closeness of the competition. Um, but I think it's, it's also the mindset. It's, it's um, to be able to um, get that consistency in in um, I guess effort and, and, and approach and, and making sure that, that the, the little things that you may have done really well the day before to get a win uh, are still there, that the hard work to, to, set, to give yourself a foundation to do it the next day or, or vice versa. If you're coming off a loss, not to be able to, not to hang on to that and, and I guess beat yourself twice just because you lost the day before and go in without confidence and those sort of things. So mindset plays a, a massive issue um, in, in the WBBL is um, obviously um, year on year there's a little bit more scrutiny and, and media and, and those sort of things um, on the tournament so um, again for, for the players and, and staff to be able to focus on, on what they can control and what's most important um, day after day and it is quite, the BBL and WBBL now they're quite long tournaments with, with 14 games in a minor round and um, so for us this year we played 17 17 matches in, in our WBBL um, there are ups and downs and we um, it certainly that was true for us this year. We lost four straight at one stage in, in the tournament. We had a couple of really tough losses in Perth that were, that were quite close to Scorched and Renegades. And, and then, um, yeah, and I think we had one, one really poor game out of the four, but there were three sort of close, close losses um, there. But it's, it's again, across a 14-game competition, that consistency to, to win enough games to, to get yourself into the final, to give yourselves an opportunity is... Is, is the message and um, that's easier said than done sometimes. Yeah, uh, thanks for mentioning those four losses. I was trying to get over them um, after <laughs> when the strikers and sports lose. I'm not a good guy to talk to. No, <laughs> I, I, obviously, I obviously still haven't got over it if I'm, if yeah. I'm mentioning it. Um, seven months later after a couple of finals. So it's, it's, it's half glass full, half glass empty, isn't it? <laughs> Especially with uh, um, Sophie Devine being us in that super over, that was a... Uh, it's hard to take, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a moral to that story with um, yeah. Sophie Devine and Super Rovers. So I think, um, yeah, we'd prefer. <laughs> yeah. I was mentioned, uh, I was, I was mentioned in the um, before the final too, but yeah, and and that's in in all seriousness, in a way. Like um, if we needed at different times, if you need you know two to win, one for a Super Over, you know, do you make sure you get the one to get into a Super Over, and and then if you get the two, it's a bonus. I'd say that's normally how a lot of people would would approach those and actually at different times, given um, not saying that, that Sophie's invincible or the Perth Scorchers are invincible necessarily in a, in a, in a super over, but are you sometimes prepared to take more risks against that particular opposition, knowing her, her prowess in a super over compared to, to other teams? Cause um, Very yeah, true. she's, um, yeah, she's a pretty special player that we've seen firsthand and on the, on a good side and the, the not so good side. Yeah. yeah I'm still, um, <laughs> So I'm forgiven Sophie for moving over to school. <laughs> yeah, I'm still a bit <laughs> slump forgiven her, but it's one of those things, isn't it? Um, so obviously we we do know the, the unfortunate side of that game against the Scorchers in the grand final. But in general, I think it it was the good result for where it was being a home game, home crowd, all that kind of stuff. It probably was, it, it was meant to be like that, I guess. But what are some things that maybe even technical wise that you're really just want to take that step further in the next season and what do those things look like? Yeah, I think, um, again, the, the, probably the two areas of our, our season at, at different times that, that were still a, a little challenge were, were our, our batting power play. Um, Katie Mack had a superb season and Dane um, contributed greatly um, as well um, on several occasions, but batting power plays are, are still so important to the, to the, results of, of game so that's that continues to be a, a real focus um, for the strikers moving forward um, and if I guess our at different times we, we bowl well enough that our 
our death overs are, you know, the last four or five overs, we probably weren't put under pressure or we had some, some stuff to play with there, but I, I still think there's areas of our, our last four or five overs in, in innings is from a, from a bowling point of view, especially given the strength of our, our bowling group that we can, we can perhaps execute a, a little better. So um, they're probably two key segments of the, of the game that I still feel like we've got um, some, some real improvement um, in us. Um, but at the same time, also recognising I don't think we're very far away. I don't think we need to change too much um, there. And, and again, as we sort of talked about, it's such a competitive competition. We're going to have to play really, really good cricket to, first of all, um, make the top four. That's the first The first step is if it remains a final four. I haven't heard the final, whether it um, <laughs> looks at the PBL game of five. So you're never quite sure what the, if there's going to be any rule changes. But yeah, first up, it's trying to win as many games as possible to, to give yourself um, that opportunity and and certainly um, yeah the home obviously the all three finals in the WBBL were won by the home team as you as you pointed out there we've obviously won our two at, at home and then and Perth won in in Perth so again um, trying to win enough games that, that may get you that that home advantage um, is certainly also a, a consideration um, there because yeah as you said it was a great atmosphere over there despite um, obviously being on the wrong end of the result. Um, yeah, after a, a year where we, the previous season, having played in a, in a hub and, and often it, um, without any crowds and, and those sort of things to, um, I think the final had 15, 16, 17,000 at, at Perth Stadium and um, and even our games at Adelaide Oval just have have our fans and, and family and friends there. It's it's what, what it's all about. So um, that was fabulous. And, and there's nowhere else I'm sure everyone would rather play than Adelaide Oval because everyone that's played there has said that it's their all-time favourite so fingers crossed that next year is going to be a it'd be nice to have a Adelaide Oval um, Strikers Grand Final I'd say yeah that'd, yeah that'd be yeah that'd be pretty cool I reckon and um, yeah I think we're very lucky in terms of the the two facilities and, and two options that we have for, for games at the moment I think they're, they're obviously they're both really different and have different atmospheres and and but they have their own their own strengths in, in Karen Rotten Oval and, and Adelaide Oval and um, um, yeah, not sure what the, the fixture will, will, will look like for, for, for next season, but I, I think speaking from a, a player point of view and, and, and the support staff point of view, we, we really enjoy games at, at both venues. It's been a while since we played Adelaide Oval and we love playing at Karen Rotten Oval, but the opportunity to play um, some games at Adelaide Oval as, as well was, was one that we, we appreciated and enjoyed. Yeah. Sure. When does the preseason start and, and when is that going to all kick back in again? Yeah, so um, SA Scorpions will probably look to to kick off um, around about the middle of June. Um, so it's not a not a huge break um, before we get going again. Um, the the CA uh, Cricket Australia players will be um, back before then though. They um, have are on a I think a six week um, leave period, um, but then um, they're very quickly into um, some camps in Brisbane and, and preparation here for for a, um, a busy winter. They've got a, a tri-series um, in Ireland in July against Ireland and Pakistan, which will then lead into the um, Commonwealth Games um, in Birmingham, um, which will be exciting. So yeah, they um, have obviously the six weeks off and, and really hopeful again that we'll have a number of players selected in in those squads, um, those squads there and, and uh, we'll be able to apply their craft um, into, uh, overseas through the through the winter time. Yeah, uh, very exciting. I'm very looking forward to the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. Hopefully, Australia can get that gold medal. That'd be great. Yeah, you think that you think they're well placed, but T20 t twenty cricket, so it's, it's um it's all over pretty quickly, and um, yeah. yeah, they're going to be a knockout sort of knockout sort of tournament or knockout games when it gets to a, a semi final, and then and then hopefully a gold medal gold medal game so it's in those sort of events it's, it's bringing your a game on on the day but you'd you'd think australia if they play their best cricket or close to their best cricket will be really well placed and in that they've been obviously the dominant team for for a period of time and and hopefully that can can continue like you said it's t20 cricket and yeah anything can happen so i'm, I'm looking forward to it it's fantastic yeah i think it's really exciting that they're getting involved in the commonwealth games as well i think that's a really good step forward in the women's cricket game but what do you think is the next step just for South Australian women's cricket? Yeah I think um, 
I think again, um, there's probably two parts to, to, to that question. I think it's, it's continuing to, to provide, um, I guess, premier cricket and club cricket as, as well as community cricket um, options and, and making sure that, that um, women and girls are, are really clear on, on where the pathway and the opportunities lie, both from a participation and, and going into to organised club environments. Um, there's lots of growth in, in participation across across Australian cricket, whether it's in the schools or different clinics and those sort of things, but but really translating those numbers into, into, into clubs and, and a real long-term involvement and, and love of the game and, and friendships and, and those sort of things is, is um, I think, one part of the puzzle. Um, second of all, continuing to, to build on um, the professionalism in, in the women's game. It's um, probably semi-professional, you'd say, in its in its nature at, at the moment. It's not quite full, not quite full time at, at Scorpions level. I still think there's there's um, growth and, and room to move there. It'll be interesting to see what plays out in um, um, longer form cricket, whether that that is something that that does have have legs or or, or not, and, and see where that goes. There was obviously two women's test matches in, in Australia this year against India in an, in an Ashes test match. And um, um, I think the way that, that those are played in the, in the, the multi-format um, sort of point series is, is fantastic. But um, yeah, whether that translates to, to some domestic cricket or, or even local cricket at different times of, of um, red ball cricket will be, will be interesting to, to see. Um, probably the other thing I think that's in, in that's absolutely pivotal is, is an expansion of the WNCL in, in some form. The eight games at the moment is, is it's not a eight days of cricket. It's not a huge um, length of time um, in that season. So um, there's certainly some, some talk and, and noise around that um, potentially going to 10 or 12 games, hopefully even the season to come. And I think that's, that's long overdue that we, we get to that point where um, there's a bit more cricket for, um, at, at that level, because I, I think our domestic competitions, the WNCL and WBBL, have been pivotal to the, the success of the, the Australian team. And obviously, England are, are starting to invest heavily with um, the 100 and, and um, Rachel Hayhoe Flint Trophy and, and Charlotte Edwards Cup and, and those sort of things there. So I think for us continuing to be on the front foot and expanding those competitions um, domestically is going to be really important to, to our long term success. Oh, uh, yeah, we need four day cricket for uh, the girls, I reckon. Um, is that something you would love to see? Yeah, I'd obviously, yeah, I think everyone on, on the ground in, in, um, in, the, in the Scorpions, it's something that we, we talk about at different times and um, that we yeah, love cricket and would love the, the ability to play more cricket. So, so again, if, if, if that came in, I think that'd be really exciting. Yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed that can happen. Yeah, just more cricket. What more could you want? Exactly. That's what we want. <laughs> More. Simple as that. Stuff American. football. Yeah. Stuff yeah. football. <laughs> yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. So we like to finish off our interviews with a couple of little fun questions. So <laughs> Josh takes over these. Nervous. Ones. Yeah. Yep. I'm nervous, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just a couple of this or that questions. So here yep. we go. Test match or T20 cricket? Uh I'm still test match. I, yeah. I, again, again, it's more it's more cricket. Um, obviously, in yeah. in the world that I, I work in and live in at the moment, it's it, it would be easy to answer T Twenty, and I, I love that part of the game. But um, yeah, the more cricket, the better. So I still love love test cricket. Yeah. Love it. Good answer. Um, pineapple on a pizza? Yes or no? Yes, I'm a massive Hawaiian pizza lover. So yep. yep. Yeah. As a plate pizza. Um, chocolate in the fridge or pantry? Uh, fridge, which is yeah. against uh, against others in my house, but um, no, I, no, I'm, I, a chocolate. I'm a chocolate in the I'm fridge. A chocolate. Well. Yeah. I'm a chocolate yeah. in the fridge person Pantry. for sure. Pantry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, horror or comedy? Uh, comedy. I get scared easily. So, yeah. yeah. Horror comedy. needs some love. Horror needs some love. <laughs> um, indoor cricket or backyard cricket? <laughs> uh, my experience is more in backyard cricket, so um, I'm going to answer that. But obviously, um, having worked closely with with Jude Coleman over the last three years, <laughs> uh, who um, I've learned a lot about indoor cricket, and and there's a lot of passion for for indoor cricket. So, um, have you played um, indoor? No, I, once or twice, but yeah, nothing yep. of it. Yeah, I've never really. Um, yeah, but um, the people that do speak very highly of it. 
<laughs> oh yes, indoor. I love indoor. <laughs> yeah. Um, morning or night? Uh, <laughs> um, somewhere in the middle, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon naps, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll go and the last one: pie or sausage roll? Uh, probably a sausage roll, but I'm partial to both. Mm-hmm. Partial to both. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. No, yeah. that is it. Well done. Not too scary, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> could be worse. We try and keep them, you know, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for jumping on and talking to us. It's been brilliant to hear what it's like to coach some South Australian teams. It's been great. Yeah, thank you um, to you both for the opportunity to come on. It's been fun. And um, yeah, thank you as well for for your support. I obviously see both of you at at various games (laughs) across the years and and, um, myself and and the playing groups really appreciate um, your support. So um, thank you. I really enjoyed that interview with Luke. So yeah. really nice for him to uh, take the time and talk to us. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, like always, very thankful that they're willing to give up their their spare time to talk to us. But yeah, yeah, like we said at the start, it was really interesting to hear all the, the behind the scenes that you don't ever really hear about. Hopefully people get a good insight to what goes on with a women's team and he was a great guy to chat to about it um because he's done so much great work for SA women's cricket and he had big shoes to fill which we talked about with uh Andrea McCauley stepping down um and him taking over from her now it was just fantastic to hear how well and what a bright future women's cricket in SA has yeah yeah absolutely so moving on the men's squad announcements happened and there was one I guess big change um, that that took place. But if I were to say I'm surprised, I would be lying. So Marcus Harris is not in the team and he hasn't been nationally contracted either. So what do you make of that? Yeah, no, it, it was interesting to see even Marcus not get a contract. I guess there's always, it's really hard at the moment with uh, spots. There's a lot of people uh, that are breaking through. Yeah, unfortunately, there's people that miss out, unluckily, on contracts. And unfortunately, Marcus was one of those that missed out. Yes, like you said, not su- Yeah, I would be lying if I said I was surprised. He's had a fair go. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's an he's a talent. He's a really good cricket player. So I wouldn't be surprised if he um, performed well and got his way back into national selection. Um, but no, he's, he knows. I think he knows what he's going to do. And he'll take it on the chin and go back and perform well for Victoria. That's a... That's, that's dangerous to have Marcus Harris um, opening for Victoria as well. Yeah, yeah. I think he didn't perform like he needed to um, in the role that he was put as in the in the summer. Really, he, he like you said, he was given time and time again more opportunities, and he just wasn't able to secure the amount of runs that he needed to in his position. Yeah. Um, so look, it, it would be good to see him pull a Kawaja and take some time just play domestically and then come back as a better and stronger player and start scoring the runs that he needs to. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure he'll do that. Harris had a really good few years ago where he scored a mountain of runs and that's what you need to do. So I hope that he can definitely do it and um, come back stronger. Um, But I don't think we've seen the last of him. Definitely not. Next up, we have the Fair Break Tournament, which begins tonight, actually, as we're putting this episode out. So, super exciting. Now, we have been talking about uh, the teams that we want to support. Now, I think it's fair to say that we both have jumped on the Barmy Army team. Yep. Now, Josh, do you want to talk about why you you selected the Barmy Army team? Yeah, so a person who I know, uh, Selena Solman, um, she's playing in that team and she's a very exciting cricketer for Vanuatu definitely watch her um, she's hopefully if we see Vanuatu on the world stage she'll be there opening I think so um, yeah keen to throw my support behind her and interested to see how all the teams go really it's going to be great to watch and keep an eye on yeah yeah I, I can agree with you there Selena I played a bit of cricket with you did too yes 2016 17 maybe so 17 I think um, yes yeah, it was good to good to see someone that you know 
on there. But also, yeah. I really, I just love how they've mixed the more professional um, cricketers with the associate nations. And I think that will give the, the younger players coming up from these associate nations just some really good experience. So for players to learn from people like Heather Knight and Laura Wolver in their team, I think will be so valuable. And I think that's what's brilliant about Fair Break is that they've got such a such a beautiful mix of all different players from all over the world. But the Barmyama team, yeah, I do I do like the look of it. Um you've also got, like I said, Heather Knight, Laura Wolvart, Selena, but Deandra Dottin, Tara Norris, um, Roberta from Brazil. It's just really exciting. <laughs> really exciting team. So looking forward to it. Yeah, like you said, it's very exciting to see those associate players get an opportunity to learn off some really good players as well. Yeah. So that starts tonight. Now, unfortunately uh, for us, the games are rather late. Um, I think they're about 10 at night and then like two in the morning. So um, no, I like it, my sleep. <laughs> we'll be watching the replays. But yep. um, yeah, they are live streamed. So if you are unsure of where you can watch it, every country has their own live streaming format. So you can head to the Fair Break social media platforms and they've got all the broadcasting details and all the teams so you can go and check them out if you need to but yeah that's that like i said starts tonight and we'll be bringing updates as to what's going on in the fair break world so next week we are joined by western australian cricketer Perth scorches cricketer english cricketer now piper cleary so super exciting to talk to piper I've known her for couple of years now so uh yeah super exciting but if you enjoyed this episode you can follow us on social media on instagram or twitter at how's that tcp or you can send us an email at how's that the cricket podcast at gmail.com but that's all from me this week that's all from me how's that? You missed the battle.